Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for the opportunity that you've given us to come together and feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is not true, all of that which has to do with self and feelings and our circumstances of walking by sight, not by faith. I ask you to seal to our hearts only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in 2 Thessalonians. We're still in chapter 2. And we've, in the last video, we took a good close-up look at uh, the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist. For uh, several years now, I've been admonishing you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I've been trying to uh, remind you, to encourage you not to be deceived by a world religious system based on human merit. We've often, uh, most of us are, f are familiar with the phrase New World Order. There is a world religious system based on human merit. Now, it, it seems obvious to me, it, and it, sh it seems like it should to most Christians, that any such a system, any, any system such as that, ought not to be, uh, should not align itself with Scripture. Uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm constantly amazed at just how many Christians believe that the, this world religious system based on human merit is one in which, which aligns itself with the truth. Jesus prayed for us that the Father would sanctify us in truth for His Word is truth. And there's always the danger of defection from truth, departure from truth. A, de a departure from a previous standing. By that, what I mean is God made, we were made the righteousness of God in Christ. We're not to depart from that. We are complete in Christ. We're not to depart from that. So we're looking at a departure from a previous standing. A departure from the faith once delivered unto the saints. These may... Many of, uh, of these uh, phrases that I'm throwing out here may be familiar to, to many of you who spend a lot of time in the New Testament. And that there are some who would trouble us and pervert the gospel of Christ. We read that in Galatians. So in, in the same sense that the Thessalonians were troubled, believing that the tribulation period had begun by the error of others, Christians today, can, we can trouble one another by perverting the gospel of Christ. Do you get my point? I pointed out how that, that I believe that modern evangelism opposes the truth of God's Word on, on how a person is redeemed and how that its message, based on human merit, what it does is it exalts man, it elevates man, and it pushes down Christ. The, the focus there is not on what Christ did. The focus is on what we must do. The, the focus being on that which is fleshly, not spiritual, earthly, not heavenly. It's man-centered. It's not Christ-centered. And how the, the only thing withholding this spirit of error is at the, at, at the present time. The only thing that withholds this spirit of the Antichrist, this spirit of error, is the gospel itself. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. But at some point, soon, I believe, the Holy Spirit in us will depart which is basically saying that we will depart, the body of Christ will depart, making way for 
the revealing of the man of sin and lawlessness. But when he is revealed, our Lord will consume him, that is, slay him. The word there in the text means to murder, to kill, to execute, to slay. Our Lord will slay him with the spirit, the breath of his mouth, the breath of his mouth. That's a, that's a word that denotes his word, which is exactly what happens even now. Interesting uh, that that's exactly what happens even now when God's word goes forth. It lays waste to error. It slays error. It consumes error. It kills error. Truth kills a lie, folks. Okay? Truth destroys it with the presence of the living word. And what we're reading in the text is that, that the Antichrist is destroyed. The, 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 the great deceiver, the one, the father of all lies, is destroyed by what? The brightness of his coming, his presence, that is, the manifestation of the living word is the enemy of sin and self. The glory of Christ and self-glory are direct opposites. They are an, an antithetical to one another. When Christ returns, He'll destroy the Antichrist with the brightness, that is, the glory of His coming. The religious system based on human merit operates with all power and signs and lying wonders. Folks, have you ever stopped to think about that? And we're looking at the text here, at the, at the Antichrist, that man of lawlessness, the man of sin, which does the same. It's striking, the similarity. He operates with all power and signs and lying wonders. Folks, listen to me. Deceiving the masses which is what most Christians th think about when they think about the Antichrist, is not what Christianity was called to do. That's been reserved for the Antichrist. Yet we are living during a period at, at the close of this present age that is exactly what I see. And I, I think there are many out there who would agree with me. That... There is a deception that is occurring among the masses. The masses are being deceived. Okay, They've been led away. They've been led astray from the, the, the purity of and the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, this was happening even in Paul's day. It was happening in the first century church. But I, I believe that we are seeing that more clearly as his return is drawing near. I don't believe that there is a Christian alive that wouldn't agree that the working of Satan is behind any deception that occurs as it concerns the church of God. So why should the nature of the Antichrist during the tribulation period be any different, folks? When the Antichrist is revealed, Men will not receive, the text says, that they will not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved because God will send upon them a strong delusion. That's the masses, okay, being deceived. Even now, during this present age, much of modern so-called Christianity has fallen prey to delusion. This is my point here, that I'm, I'm really pushing this point. I want you to see this, these similarities. They're striking. The masses are being deceived to accept another message, okay? Just as the masses today are being deceived to accept another gospel, the Antichrist will deceive the masses into believing that mankind is the master of his destiny. He's the one who determines his fate. That he doesn't need God. And this, I dare say, is what modern Christianity does. I'm hoping that you see the similarities here because they are striking. 
I'll go ahead and say this. Uh, I was going to save this for the end of the video, but I'll go ahead and say, say it now. Folks, listen. Why would God allow the Thessalonians to be entertained by the idea that, that by all appearances, they were in the tribulation period? Why would God allow that? Um, I, I remember just the other day, I was... I was really wanting some watermelon. I just had a craving for watermelon. Do you think, let me ask you, do you think that God knew that not only did he know that I would crave that watermelon, but here's my question, and I hope I phrase this right. Do you think that that little seemingly non-significant incident and there's, there's thousands of those in our lives. You know, we're driving through McDonald's and it's like, well, are we going to get, uh, are we going to order French fries or, or onion rings? I mean, you know, it's, and, and does God have anything to do with that? That's my point. Does, is God concerned about that? Does he have anything to do with that? Or is that just, does that lie outside the realm of spiritual, uh, and I can't think of the word, does that lie outside the realm of spiritual activity? Is that something that, well, God just doesn't, well, I, God doesn't care if I have French fries or onion ring. God doesn't care if I, if I think of something, if I'm thinking about traveling to another state. Now, look, I'm not a fatalist, but you know I believe in God's sovereignty, and I don't believe that He allows anything to touch our lives except it be for our ultimate good. Nothing comes our way, folks, except it comes through our Heavenly Father's loving hand. Okay? If we have a thought in our head, it's because I believe, and you may not agree with me, but I believe it's because God allowed that thought to be there. Okay? Why would God allow these believers at Thessalonica... To, to even be entertained by the thought that, that they were going through the tribulation period. I believe that it was to teach them to rely on the truth of what God had told them previously through Paul rather than on what they were seeing or how they felt or what others may have told them. That's, that's what I'm seeing here. Folks, we walk by faith, not by sight. Were, ask yourself, were these believers at Thessalonica walking by faith, the truth of God's Word, what they had been told by God through Paul, or were they walking by sight? Were they walking by feelings? Were they allowing their emotions to take the place of faith? That's, that's my question. Okay. We'll read uh, at the end of, well, if we skip down all the way to, to verse 13, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Well, there's... You can't, you can't read those words, folks, without seeing God's absolute sovereign uh, sovereignty in that, without seeing election in that. Election, you can't talk about election without, apart from God's sovereignty. Chosen you to salvation through what? Sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, look, listen, listen. Therefore, brethren, stand fast, stand fast, and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. It's no wonder that we come to these words after going through and looking at the spirit of the Antichrist, which practically mirrors the age of deception that we're living in now. Now, 
Now I'm going to put this up here on the screen. I, I hope you'll see it. Maybe you'll see it. Maybe you won't. But this is where I'm at in chapter two. And if that looks like a mess to you, well, let me, I'll, I'll let you in on a secret. It looks like a mess to me too. But I've familiarized myself with it, you know, highlighting words, underlying words, taking and looking at the meanings of words, particularly in the Greek, uh, cross-referencing, uh, looking at similarities, looking at contrasts, looking at, uh, you know, certain identities. Uh, yeah, I feel compelled to pour myself into this to... The better that I understand the text, the better that I that I can present it. Because I uh, usually, normally, I will look at something like this as I do these videos. I'll look at what I what I uh, have come to refer to as uh, you know graphics, uh, text, verse, graphics, uh, and so. I can't remember exactly where we were, where we left off, but I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Uh, beginning at verse 1, we'll do a little review. Now, we beseech you, brethren, that is, and, and that word brethren is means a whole lot. We tend to skip over this, breeze over it so quickly that we forget we, we to take note of the fact that this is all inclusive. It's not to a select group of believers. By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pointed out that the word coming is the word presence. You can translate it presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. And we spent some time talking about the difference between the rapture and the second coming. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Now here's, here's, here's where it's interesting here. Troubled. Neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter is from us that the day of Christ is at hand. That, that phrase, day of Christ, is literally day of the Lord. It's a, it's a particular period, folks. It describes, that phrase, day of the Lord, describes a specific period that begins at the tribulation. It actually begins at the rapture, but it's not just the rapture, but it, it begins at the rapture. It marks the seven-year tribulation period and the return of Christ and the thousand-year reign of Christ. That is the day of the Lord. It even includes the thousand-year millennial kingdom. That's the day of the Lord. Not to be sh soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Now, li now listen. Does this sound familiar to you? Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you, hello, trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Back to our text. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Verse 3. We're looking at deception. We're getting into the subject of deception. Shaken in mind, troubled, deceiving, being deceived by any means. For that day, the day of the Lord shall not come except there come a falling away first. Falling away. We're, folks, the word is apostasy, as many of you probably know. Apostasia in the Greek. The word means departure. You could literally translate this, except there come a departure first. This is why many believers believe that this is referring to the church being raptured. The departure of the church. 
but the word simply just means departure, and we're to take this and look at this in context. Departure, that is a defection from the truth. The word departure in the, in the context here is a defection from truth, a departure from a previous standing. Could be the, the departure of the church. You could take it that way. I know I have many Christian friends who do. It is, it is not, I don't believe, a question. There's no question about the fact that the, this will occur before the day of the Lord. Okay? A departure from a previous standing. Hello. A departure from a, a defection from the truth. You could honestly say, in all truth, that we're seeing that even today. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, opposes and exalts himself. When, when I read that word oppose, it, it takes me to Philippians 1.28. Oppose, it, this, this, we see the same word in no way alarmed by your opponents, same word, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. Fits right into our context here. Because at the end of, as I pointed out, at, at the end of this little diatribe concerning the Antichrist, what we're seeing is Paul saying, Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hath, he's from the beginning chosen us to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. And then we, we read in Philippians 1.28, In no way being alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. Interesting. Opposeth. The Antichrist opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. And, and, and during this present age, we have, this is the point I want you to see, we have those who are doing the same thing. These are what Paul refers to in Philippians as our opponents. They are opposing, doing the same thing. And if you look at the context, the subject matter, it's law versus grace. They are opposing and exalting themselves above all that is called God. That's the point I want you to see here. Or that is worshipped, says concerning the Antichrist, or that is worshipped so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God. We are Christ's body, the temple. Folks, it's not hard to see the stark similarities here. Showing himself that he is God. What is it, folks, that, that we as Christians do when we try to assume control of our lives and we trust in our own ability and our own strength? What is it that we're literally trying to do? whether consciously or subconsciously, we're trying, without, maybe perhaps without knowing it, but we are assuming the, the role of God in our lives. We're playing God in our lives. And this is what the Antichrist does, showing himself that he is God. He sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God. Verse 5, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Paul's saying, look, you, sh you should know this. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. And I pointed out in the last video how I believe that that, because that is neuter, that that refers, it has to refer to the gospel. The gospel is that which is withholding this, this literal Antichrist, 
from arriving on the scene and doing what he does until God's proper time, God's timing, not the Antichrist, but God's timing, that the gospel is holding that back. And verse 7 is the most interesting phrase. There's the most interesting phrase there. It just, it really, it just causes me to really stand up and take notice. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That's that's the whole when I'm when I when I'm trying to point out, folks, these striking similarities, it's it's absolutely confirmed by the first few words there in verse seven. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. It's the same iniquity. The word iniquity is lawlessness. It it may read iniquity in your in your King James Version. But the word, literally, it means lawlessness. If you go back to our study in Romans chapter 3, we, we read, uh, do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. In other words, we establish the law through faith. Okay, we don't establish the law through law. We've died to the law that we might live unto God. We're not under law, folks. We're under grace. Paul says, do we then nullify the law, make the law of no effect through faith? No, we don't make the law of no effect through faith. On the contrary, we establish the law. How do we establish the law? Through faith. Through faith. Romans chapter 3, verse 31. So, if we continue on in this, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now lets it will let until he be taken out of the way. There's, there's the word he there. That is that is not neuter. That's masculine. That is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is removed. And the Holy Spirit lives in us. The church departs. Therefore, the Holy Spirit departs. It doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit has, is done with the earth. Okay? What it means is the Holy Spirit continues working in a different capacity, in a different way. That's what it means. But the body of Christ has departed. And therefore, the Holy Spirit in us, the church, His body, is taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. So when that departure takes place, the wicked one is revealed. Okay? And folks, when you take and remove truth, when you take truth out of the way, the, what is the result? Wickedness, sin, lawlessness, everything that is of, I'll just say it, the devil, everything that is, you know, deception will take the place of truth. Where truth is not presented, you're going to have non-truth. So we see a striking similarity right there as well. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume, that is kill, the word is kill, with the spirit of his mouth, his word. Okay, and that's what his word does. His word, God's word, folks. It's just like when God said, let there be light, darkness fled. He consumes, He kills the Antichrist with the spirit of His mouth, the breath. The word spirit is breath. The breath of His mouth. And shall destroy with the brightness of His, of his coming, His glory, the glory of God, folks. We see a similarity there too. The glorious manifestation of His coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Do you think that doesn't happen today? Let's go back up to verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. It's already at work, folks. So do you think that these words that we're reading here concerning the Antichrist, 
even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Do you think that doesn't occur today? And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. See, Steve, there you go. We got to receive. We got to receive. We got to receive. We got to have a love for the truth. We've got to, we have to receive the gospel. Arminians, folks, they love this verse. Without drawing a direct line to 1 Corinthians 2.14, I guess they fail to, to take 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 into account that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The reason, folks, that these, the, the reason that these individuals in verse 10 received not the love of the truth that they might be saved is because they couldn't. Not that the text is, is not saying that, well, it, they could. If, if only they would receive, you know, the love of the truth, then they'd be saved. This is why it is so important to cross-reference, folks. Scripture supports Scripture. If we, didn't, if we didn't know that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, that they're foolishness unto him, that he can't know them because they are spiritually discerned, if we didn't know that, then I, I could understand how that we could look at them not receiving the love of the truth that they might be saved, read that as though as though they had somehow they had the ability within themselves to receive the truth of God's word to have a love for the, the truth of God's word but we know from so many other verses of scripture that that is just simply not the case at all in fact that other that's another gospel okay that's the man-centered gospel. That's the very deception that we're looking at here. Verse 12, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's an interesting phrase. Pleasure in unrighteousness. And we read those words, and we automatically, our minds snap to, well, that must be, uh, well, it's, it's really fun to get drunk. Now, that's pleasure in unrighteousness. all the time failing to realize that in the Christian context, folks, in the religious context, when it comes to spirituality, when it comes to our relationship with Christ, whether it's based on truth or error, that there is pleasure in unrighteousness even on the good side of, of the equation. All right? If you are living under the law and satisfied with that, and you can't wait to get back back into that, that Bible study group or that fellowship to, to continue on along that path of deception, you are taking pleasure in unrighteousness. The, the strength of sin is the law, folks. Okay? They believed not the truth, but they had pleasure in unrighteousness. I believe we can look at it both ways. I'm not trying to discredit. I'm not trying to say that that isn't that that isn't a referring to taking pleasure in in you know killing someone. Or robbing someone or anything else. I'm, what I'm saying is is that we don't want we you cannot just simply limit that to to something that's typically bad. Uh, in the sense that we commonly think of bad. They took pleasure in unrighteousness. This after the working of Satan, can, or this uh, where the Lord shall consume with the spirit of His mouth. He'll kill the Antichrist with the spirit of, of, of His mouth. This is what truth does, folks. It always does that. It always, always will do that. Truth displaces error. 
in the lives of God's people. They receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Strong delusion. Man, I, you can highlight that, that, highlight that verse, that, those words. Strong delusion. And then ask yourself one simple question. If you are a follower of the true gospel, if you believe in the true gospel, that the gospel is what Christ did, not what man must do, and if you have come in to, the, to the point in your walk, in your relationship with Christ, to understand that the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord, is not that we are redeemed by anything that we do. It's not that, well, if we'll believe or receive or accept or repent or be baptized or, or whatever, whatever you want to add to that list, then God will act and God will then... Uh, then we'll be born again. And it's, and it's at our timing and our choosing. God has, really has nothing to do with it. He's just kind of hung it out there, kind of like you'd put a worm on a hook to catch a fish. You know, He's hung it out there. He's waiting for you to swim by, you know. And then, you know, when He sees the bobber go down, well, then He just, then He hooks you. And then He reels you in. But you had to nibble. You had to bite. Folks, that is not the gospel. Okay? The gospel is that Jesus Christ died in our place. We are redeemed simply because He chose us in Him. The text tells us right here, hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief. Sanctification of what? Of, of us? No, of the Spirit. Sanctification, setting, setting aside for service of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Belief. Well, Steve, see, you know, we've got to believe. Well, if, if you want to put the cart before the horse and say that we believe and then we're, it's, we're only redeemed because we believe, go right ahead. You won't find a verse in Scripture that says that. What you will find is, is that we believe because we've been redeemed. Okay? But during this period, God will send them strong delusion. That is, you can't read that without, folks, you cannot read that without seeing that it is the, realizing that what that is saying is that the masses are deceived. Okay? The masses are deceived. Well, are they today? that they should believe a lie. The word lie there is, is you, many of you are familiar with the word pseudo, artificial. Uh, Sude is the Greek word. It means what is false. Uh, it's pseudo. You know, if you have an artificial something, anything, artificial leather, okay, it's, it's pseudo leather. It's, it's artificial. They believe what's artificial. They believe what is Pseudo, it's, it's, I believe nowadays you're seeing, we are witnessing the greatest display of pseudo Christianity that any generation has ever observed. That's my personal belief. And that's because we are living so close to all of this happening that they might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. Folks, God loves us. Because God hath from the beginning chosen us to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto He called you. Okay? You didn't call Him. He called you. His Word does that. He called you by our gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ, of what He did to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word glory will always mean an estimation of something's worth. The glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is, what is He worth? What is our Lord worth? Therefore, brethren, stand fast. 
Stand fast. And hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. There, there's where we're at in this study. And I am running out of time. I want to thank you all. I love you truly, dearly. From the bottom of my heart, I love you all. I truly do. I thank you for all your continued interest in these studies as we move forward into Ruth. We're gonna, uh, I was asked to if I would consider doing a verse-by-verse -verse study through Ruth. So that's where we're going after we finish our study in 2 Thessalonians. Once again, I, I, I want to thank you all for all of your kind comments that you leave uh, on uh, the YouTube channel and, and on uh, Facebook. I, I thank you for your continued love, your prayers for this ministry. I ask you to continue praying for the direction of this ministry. And I want you all to know that I pray for all of you constantly. I truly do. I thank you all for your love, your kindness, your prayers, your support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.